Hey there, and thanks for tuning in for another service with Discover Life Seventh-day Adventist Church, where our mission is to know God, grow together, and do good. First off, I'm not trying to set up some cool, fancy background. Um, the HVAC isn't really working for me as a backdrop. But given that our only announcement today is a continued reminder that we're meeting outdoor for church, appropriately socially distanced with masks and our own lawn chairs, with Sabbath school at 1030 and the church service at 930, and I guess the only other announcement being that Pastor Nathan is back! Crowd goes crazy! Anyways. Well, I'm hanging out in my HVAC section because among my attempts to be a good steward, I had something go wrong in my rental unit. That something was that my HVAC system gave out. And now, it gave out for a very specific reason. <sighs> and that reason is that I hooked up my generator to it, and the generator apparently spiked something, and it wasn't happy, and the HVAC system shut off, so when the power came back on, the normal stuff, and I plugged it back into the house, nothing. And it was just cold. It was 40 degrees outside. So we had our two little space heaters going non-stop. But I felt like this tied in a little bit with today's giving story. You see, I had a couple of options with that. The first one was I could simply blame it on the power outage, call my landlord and say, look, the HVAC system isn't working anymore um, ever since the power came back on. Factually correct, but not completely honest. And so I decided to take a different route with this. So I'm no HVAC expert, but I'm a handyman, and so I decided, well, first of all, I should try and assess what's going on. So I got up my multimeter, got all my little tools, noticed that the LED was off for the system, plugged things in, unplugged them, checked the fuses, all these things. Well, this is what I saw when I decided to go a layer deeper. I saw an HVAC system with a little place where an orange LED is normally supposed to go that the little orange LED wasn't glowing anymore. So I said, well, what do you do when the light's off? You look inside to see what's turned the light on. And wouldn't you know it, I looked inside and there were wires and things and doodads that I had no know-how uh, what to do with them, but I figured, well, first thing you're gonna check for in a system like this is, are there any fuses? And sure enough, that little purple thing right there at the top in the middle is a fuse. Um, and right next to it, the little yellow thing is the LED that should be blinking and glowing. Well, we're not trying to make this all about electronics and about repairs, but the long and short of it was I realized I do not have enough know-how to repair this on my own. At least that was my initial thought. So I called up my landlord and I went with the, what I felt like was the most honest option. And I said, landlord, I seem to have screwed this up. Um, here's exactly what I did. I unplugged the HVAC system from the house, there was no fuse between it and the generator, um, but it fried. So I said, I'm sure you have an HVAC guy, but look, I know this is my fault, 100% planning to pay for it. I just wanted to be upfront with you, let you know it happened, and make sure that I was calling the appropriate people since it is your house and I wanna be respectful. Now, up to this point, I had prayed and I said, God, I'd really like the system to just start working. Um, I don't wanna tell the landlord I potentially screwed something up and hopefully I didn't, but your will be done. And for whatever reason God hasn't revealed yet, his will apparently was that I tell my landlord because here's the funny thing that happened. I told him and within two hours, I had figured something out. I realized in doing this that off over to the side, there's actually a set of instructions that are attached. And I followed those instructions and was able to determine that there's a very specific component that had gone bad. What this component does is it just changes the voltage so that when you plug in your fancy thermostat, it's not frying and it's not like a scary voltage up there. And I believe scary voltage is in fact the correct technical term. Well, good news was I had another power supply with the same voltage, plugged it in and everything started working. So I didn't need to bring in the HVAC guy and I had a cool opportunity to be honest with my landlord and for God to put my face to the test as to what the right decision was to make. So $30 lesson learned, make sure there's a fuse between your generator and your HVAC system if you're gonna try and go that route. But the giving lesson that came out of this for me is we do have a responsibility. A responsibility to whatever it is that God has given us to manage. Whether another person on this earth technically owns it or whether we technically own it according to the world's eyes, 
We're supposed to treat it all as though the assets belong to the Lord and we're serving Him with these assets. God didn't give me the solution until I'd already gone through the steps of following what He was convicting me to do in reaching out to my landlord, even though it was uncomfortable and not something I was looking forward to doing. And so it is with our giving, with our tithes and our offerings. Sometimes the Lord will convict us of things and ask us to be joyful about giving them without showing us the outcome. So my prayer for each and every one of you this week is that as you give, as you pray to the Lord about what his conviction for you is, don't trust that it's gonna be easy, but trust that he's gonna be with you each step of the way. And that whatever conviction he's placing on your heart, there's a reason for it. And he's going to follow it up with some type of outcome that will be positive for his kingdom. So as I wrap up, remember that you can always give online by going to discoverlifesonora.org. Click on the Give button, and this will redirect you to adventistgiving.org, where your donations will be credited to the Discover Life Seventh-day Adventist Church. Remember there, you can give your tithe, your offering, give something to our Imagine campaign, or to any other cause that you may desire. And on that note, let me wrap it up by saying that on behalf of Discover Life Sonora, our staff and media team, We're grateful that each and every one of you have chosen to join us today and hope that you're blessed by today's worship experience.
Today for children's story, I would like to read to you the tale of the three trees. Once upon a mountaintop, three little trees stood and dreamed of what they wanted to become when they grew up. The first little tree looked up at the stars twinkling like diamonds above him. I want to hold treasure, he said. I want to be covered with gold and filled with precious stones. I will be the most beautiful treasure chest in the world. The second little tree looked out at the small stream trickling by on its way to the ocean. I want to be a strong sailing ship, he said. I want to travel mighty waters and carry powerful kings. I will be the strongest ship in the world. The third little tree looked down to the valley below where busy men and busy women worked in a busy town. I don't want to leave this mountaintop at all, she said. I want to grow so tall that when people stop to look at me, they will raise their eyes to heaven and think of God. I will be the tallest tree in the world. Years passed. The rains came, the sun shone, and the little trees grew tall. One day, three woodcutters climbed the mountain. The first woodcutter looked at the first tree and said, This tree is beautiful. It's perfect for me. With a swoop of a shining axe, the first tree fell. Now I shall be made into a beautiful chest, thought the first tree. I shall hold wonderful treasure. The second woodcutter looked at the second tree and said, This tree is strong. It is perfect for me. With a swoop of a shining axe, the second tree fell. Now I shall sail mighty waters, thought the second tree. I shall be a strong ship for kings. The third tree felt her heart sink when the last woodcutter looked her way. She, touched, she stood straight and tall and pointed bravely to heaven, but the woodcutter never even looked up. Any kind of tree will do for me, he muttered. 
with a swoop of a shining axe, the third tree fell. The first tree rejoiced when the woodcutter brought him to a carpenter shop, but the busy carpenter was not thinking about treasure chests. Instead, his work-worn hands fashioned the tree into a feed box for animals. The once beautiful tree was not covered with gold or filled with treasure. He was coated with sawdust and filled with hay for hungry farm animals. The second tree smiled when the woodcutter took him to a shipyard, but no mighty sailing ships were being made that day. Instead, the once strong tree was hammered and sawed into a simple fishing boat. Too small and too weak to sail an ocean or even a river, he was taken to a little lake. Every day, he brought in loads of dead, smelly fish. The third tree was confused when the woodcutter cut her into strong beams and left her in a lumber yard. What happened, the once tall tree wondered. All I ever wanted to do was stay on the mountaintop and point to God. Many, many days and nights passed. The three trees nearly forgot their dreams. But one night, golden starlight poured over the first tree as a young woman placed her newborn baby in the feed box. I wish I could make a cradle for him, her husband whispered. The mother squeezed his hand and smiled at the starlight sh as the starlight shone on the smooth and sturdy wood. This manger is beautiful, she said. And suddenly, the first tree knew he was holding the greatest treasure in the world. One evening, a child traveler and his friends crowded into the old fishing boat. The traveler fell asleep as the second tree quietly sailed out into the lake. Soon, a thundering and a thrashing storm arose. The little tree shuddered. He knew he did not have the strength to carry so many passengers safely through the wind and rain. The tired man awakened. He stood up, stretched out his hand, and said, Peace. The storm stopped as quickly as it had begun. And suddenly, the second tree knew he was carrying the king of heaven and earth. One Friday morning, the third tree was startled when her beams were yanked from the forgotten from the forgotten woodpile. She flinched as she was carried through an angry, jeering crowd. She shuddered when soldiers nailed a man's hands to her. She felt ugly and harsh and cruel. But on Sunday morning, when the sun rose and the earth trembled with joy beneath her, the third tree knew that God's love had changed everything. It made the first tree beautiful. It had made the second tree strong. And every time people thought of the third tree, they would think of God. And that was better than being the tallest tree in the world. The end. Hello and welcome to Discover Life's online experience. My name is Pastor Nathan, and I am the senior pastor here at Discover Life Seventh-day Adventist Church. For those of you who regularly tune in, you know that I've been away for six weeks on a sabbatical. And I just want to say a huge thank you to my church who gave me six weeks of uninterrupted time away to rest and recharge and to come back to the work that God has called me and us to uh, stronger and more passionate. So I want to thank you for the time away, and I want to let you know that I'm really happy to be back with the church family here in Sonora, and also for those of you that tune in to the live stream. I'm so happy to, to welcome 
each and every one of you to Discover Life's online worship experience. Before we jump into the message, I would like to pray for uh, our service. Dear God, we thank you for your goodness and love. We thank you for your generosity and kindness. Father, today, as we study the word, we ask that you would teach and instruct us. Father, we come to you with our cares, our sorrows, our heartbreaks, our concerns, and we lay them at your feet, knowing that you are good and generous, that you are forgiving and gracious. Father, lift those burdens from us and fill us with the joy that comes by your Spirit. Father, as we read your word, may you teach us and uh, may we grow through hearing you speak. In Jesus' name, amen. In his earthly ministry, Jesus healed the sick, he gave sight to the blind, he raised the dead, and he fed the hungry. He perfectly represented the true beauty and goodness of who God really is. He perfectly embodied the character of God. Everywhere he went, he sought to relieve human suffering and to provide a balm against the heartbreaking problems of the world. Now, this this generosity that Jesus expressed actually led the disciples to kind of almost imagine that the utopia was coming, that God's kingdom was going to break in, and that, that all things were going to be right. And so as Jesus is heading toward the crucifixion, one of the the greatest crisis of his life, Jesus said these words, John 16, verse 33, I have said these things to you that you, uh, that in me, you may have peace in the world. You will have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Now, I want to notice specifically these words, you will have tribulation. Jesus, uh, you know, this is an incredibly important thing for Jesus to say. Again, given the context of him healing the sick, raising the dead, giving sight to the blind, uh, giving hearing to the deaf, Jesus uh, delivering the leopard, feeding the hungry, all these things, again, put yourself in the minds of the disciples. You're like, we have this miracle worker. I mean, he literally can solve any problem. And now Jesus is saying, this is who God really is. He is generous. He is kind. He is good. He is, he is in favor of human flourishing. This is who God is. And, and you can imagine the disciples would think to themselves, then that means that all problems are now going away on a permanent basis. And Jesus says, no. In the world, you will have tribulations. The word tribulations, it's philipsis, and it means just what you'd expect it to mean, distress that is brought about by outward or inward circumstances. Uh, Distress that is brought about by outward or inward circumstances. And I look through the New Testament, and actually I look through the Greek Old Testament as well, for examples of the kinds of tribulations that people experience. So where this word, thalipsis, is used, and then the kind of difficulty that's described, okay? So uh, this difficulty is used to describe war. This is used to describe death. It's used to describe sickness. It's used to describe the pain of labor. It is used to describe the heartbreak of imprisonment. It's used to describe the heartbreaking pain when somebody slanders you. It is used to describe the uh, painful physical labor. It's used to describe hunger and homelessness, it's used in one specific example uh, to be treated like the scum of the earth, okay? That's a tribulation. It's also used to describe beatings and poverty in general. Okay, so I want you to think of that list. I want you to think war, death, sickness, 
uh, birth pangs, imprisonment, slander, physical labor, hunger, homelessness, being treated like the scum of the earth, beatings, and poverty. Those are just a few of the examples of how this particular Greek word is used. Jesus, who is solving all those problems. Jesus solves the problem of death. He solves the problem of sickness. He solves so many of these problems, it would have been likely that the disciples would think to themselves, oh, uh, Jesus is here. The Messiah is here. Everything is going to be great. And Jesus says, you will have tribulations. You will have tribulations. Now, of course, he does say, take heart. I have overcome the world. You know, it's fascinating. When we look at John 16, this is the end of John 16. Jesus, Jesus does not then go into some long dissertation about how to endure tribulations. In fact, in response to the question, how would we endure tribulations? The unasked question, how would we endure tribulation? Jesus doesn't say anything to the disciples. In fact, John 14, John 15, John 16 have all been this long teaching to the disciples. Now in John 17, Jesus says, you will have tribulation, take heart, I've overcome the world. Jesus now begins to pray. And the disciples overhear his prayer. By recording the prayer, John invites his readers to eavesdrop on the intimacy of a moment of prayer between Jesus and God the Father. And as we listen carefully to this prayer, we actually discover several core truths that will really help us to endure the difficulties of life. And I'm going to start here just in John 17, verse 1. When Jesus had spoken these words, so after Jesus has says, said to the disciples, in the world you will have tribulation, after Jesus has said, but take heart, I have overcome the world, Jesus immediately goes into prayer. He lifted up his eyes to heaven. Interesting When Jesus prayed, he didn't bow his head and close his eyes. He lifted his eyes toward heaven, which was standard practice in the Jewish community. And he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that the son may glorify you. Now, the first thing that we need to notice here is that Jesus, as a human, required prayer. When he knew he was facing a trial, and you see that Jesus knows, he's, he's praying that, that God would glorify his son. And in the Gospel of John, the cross is the glory of the son. The cross is this grand revelation of the character of God. God is glorifying the son in the crucifixion because in the crucifixion, God is sending a message that he would rather die for sinners. He would rather die for us than live apart from us. So Jesus knows he is facing, he himself is facing the greatest trial of his life. He is facing the most uh, difficult challenge of his life. And, and yet this moment, this challenge, challenge is also the, the, the thing that brings the most glory to God because it reveals the character of God in all of its beauty. And Jesus, as he is going into this greatest moment of trial, he commits to prayer, to connecting with the Father in an in intimate moment. Maybe I should say it this way. Jesus did not rely upon his own strength in a moment of trial. And we should not rely on our own strength when we face trials. Jesus, when he faced trials, was dependent upon God. He was dependent on the grace of God. He trusted in God 
in the moment of his greatest trial. And he trusted that through this horrible trial, somehow God would be glorified and good would come from it. And so too, just the from the example of Jesus' prayer in this moment of trial, we too, when we face trials, should trust ourselves to the grace of God. We should trust ourselves to God and we connect with him through prayer. Verse two, since you have given him authority, that's the father has given Jesus authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. The second thing I want us to notice uh, as we imagine our lives and we are enduring trials, whether that trial is the sick, your sickness, the sickness of your spouse, the sickness of your child. Maybe you're suffering a job loss because of Corona. Maybe you've lost a loved one because of Corona. Maybe you are suffering right now through a terrible tribulation and and you're saying to yourself, Jesus, I thought you were God and I thought you were going to solve all my problems and, and yet I'm still having tribulations. Jesus comes and says, look, first off, when you're in a tribulation, do what I did. I trusted myself to God in prayer. Trust that God is at work even when it seems like he isn't. Number two, Jesus says here in John 17, verse three, that God gives eternal life to those who know him. Now, this to me is so incredibly exciting, right? That, that, that God promises us the gift of everlasting life. That is that no matter what happens to you, no matter what is taken from you, right? If you lose your health and your strength and your wealth and, and you die, God has promised through Jesus the gift of everlasting life. My friends, I just want you to bask in that for a moment. All throughout the Gospel of John, John gives us this incredible promise of hope through Jesus Christ. John 3, verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. God has promised eternal life to those who believe in Jesus. I love the way it said in John 10, 28, I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of the father's hand. Notice what Jesus says. Jesus says in verse 28 that you are in his hand. And in verse 29, he says that you are in the father's hand. My friend, when you face trials and tribulations, Jesus, Jesus, when facing a trial and a tribulation prayed, and he prayed about the promise of eternal life. When you face a trial, when you face a tribulation, remind yourself that God has given you the gift of eternal life in Jesus Christ. Remind yourself that you are safe in the hands of Jesus. Remind yourself that you are safe in the hand of the Father. You know, it's so interesting. When I was back home, my mom reminded me of an incredible story. My grandmother, my mother's mother, was not a religious person, um, which, which is really really in many ways understandable. So much of the world of her day, they were miners. My grandfather was a miner. And so often religion was used as a tool to keep workers in place. Um, in, in, in England, if you worked a year and a day after you were an adult, you became a slave to the mine. And that sort of slavery mentality 
um, continued among mine owners, um, really even into the 1900s here. Um, and as a result of that sort of slavery kind of mentality that, that mine owners had, um, and then they used God as a, as a, um, as a, as a tool to enforce that because they were the ones that God placed into that position. Many miners, um, were, were non-believers. They, they really rejected the concept of God. And so throughout my life, my grandmother's life, she, she, she really wasn't a Christian. She wasn't an active Christian. But as she neared the end of her life, and she really fought against death, she really struggled to live. She wanted to keep living. But when it came right down to the end, the words she said still touch our family's heart to this day. She said she was safe in the arms of Jesus. My friend, when you face a trial, when you face a tribulation, when you face a trouble, the place that you should go is to the simple fact that God has given you the good gift of eternal life, that you are safe in the hands of Jesus, that you are safe in the arms of a good, good father. Now, in John chapter 17, there is a third critical point that helps us in any trial or tribulation that we may face. We're going to skip ahead here to John chapter 17, verse 20. Jesus says, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will be who will believe in me through their word. Okay, so Jesus is praying, and Jesus is saying, I'm not only praying for my 12 disciples, I'm praying for the people that will believe through their word. Uh, so I'm praying for all believers through all time. Now, I want you to notice what Jesus is praying, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Now, what I want you to notice here, and most of the time when preachers read this, they read it as a command to the church to be unified. And certainly there are commands to the church to be unified in the New Testament. But to me, that misses something incredible in this text. This text is not so much a command to be unified, it is a promise of intimacy. It is a promise. It is a promise and a prayer for intimacy. Jesus here prays to the Father that, that they, that's us, may be in us. That's God the Father in Jesus Christ. Jesus is here praying that we as believers, as individuals, and as a corporate body would experience incredible, deep intimacy with the Father and the Son. And that as we experience incredible, deep intimacy with God the Father and God the Son, that we would then experience incredible, deep intimacy with one another. Here we see, I believe, as we listen to Jesus' prayer, remember John's prayer here, Jesus' prayer in John 17, comes right after he tells them that they're going to experience tribulation. And, and the first thing we learn is that, the, that, that Jesus simply prays, trusting in the goodness and the grace of God. The second thing we learn is that we have the gift of eternal life, and that can help us through our trials and tribulations. The third thing we learn here is that God is, God's desire for us is to have incredible, heartfelt intimacy with the Father and the Son and with each other. And that intimacy with the Father and the Son can be a real strength to us when we are facing the difficulties of life. And the intimacy that we have in the church community can, can 
be a real comfort to us when we face the difficulties of life. My friends, I I want you to just pour into intimacy with God and with Jesus. They love you. They love us all of us. They will never abandon us. They will never forsake us. They will always draw near to us. And so draw near to the Father and the Son in intimacy with God and draw near to your church family in intimacy. And this has been hard, right? We're all suffering with the coronavirus whether it's the regulations that keep us from one another or um, the genuine fear of the sickness. I just want to encourage you to press into intimacy with God and with Jesus and with your, your fellow believers. Do not allow your heart to be alienated from one another. Press together in intimacy with God, with the Christ, and with one another. Jesus continues here, the glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one even as we are one. As the Father and the Son are in intimate relationship, Jesus shares that glory with us and invites us into that intimacy. I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you loved me. My friends, we've talked about this before, but there's this circle of love that exists between the members of the Trinity. The Father loves the Son and the Spirit. The Son loves the Spirit and the Father. And the Spirit loves the Son and the Father. And and this circle of intimacy included at creation was expanded to include humanity. And, and through Christ, we are welcomed into that beautiful circle of love. We as individuals are welcomed in, and then we become the community of faith. And as the community of faith, we are in the circle of God's love. And, 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 and I want you to get this as we know and experience that love of God, and we live in the intimacy of that love and we live together in intimacy with one another, and we bask in the gift of eternal life. We trust that God is with us and caring for us. These things are a real balm. They are. They really bring comfort in the trials and tribulations of life. Jesus goes on, verse 26, I made known to them your name, God, name in the Bible represents the character. God has really revealed the character, his own character in Christ. And I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. Jesus is making this incredible point that, that, that all the love the Father and the Son have is available to us, and we are included in that. And that's the kind of community that we have the opportunity to become, a community that is in, in, encircled by the great and glorious love of the Father. There's a fourth thing in this chapter that is incredibly important that will definitely help as we encounter suffering. And I want you to look at John 17, verse 17, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Now, this word sanctify, often we hear this word and we think of the theological concept called sanctification. Sanctification is growth in holiness, right? So we read this verse and, 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 and we typically hear it saying something like, grow them in holiness in the truth. Your word is truth. And so we think that Jesus is saying something like, God, can you make your people more and more holy as they understand your truth more and more? And that is certainly a true concept, but I don't think that's what Jesus is saying here in John 17, verse 17. The word sanctify, it, 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 in, it, in some rare occasions, can mean growth and holiness, but 
But that's a theological teaching that is, that is, that's not really rooted in this word. I, I hate to, sit, to, to break it to you. This word is hagio, okay? And it's just the Greek word for holy. When something is sanctified, it is made holy. It is consecrated, okay? It's consecrated for some purpose, okay? So Jesus is saying, consecrate them, set them apart in, your, in the truth, your word is truth. And by the way, you might remember John 14, where Jesus says, I am the way, the truth and the life. And you might remember John chapter one, verse one, which says in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God in the gospel of John, Jesus is the truth and Jesus is the word. So here set them apart in the truth in Jesus Jesus is the truth. All right. Now, what does it mean to be set apart? Well, check this out. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. For their sake, I consecrate, same Greek word, hagio. For their sake, I consecrate myself that they also may be, same Greek word, here and here, consecrate, sanctified, that they may be sanctified in the truth. Okay, now, Jesus is saying, set them apart, in verse 17, sanctify them, set them apart in the truth, your word is truth. Verse 18, as you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. You, you, I don't know if I'm doing a good job of explaining this, but the key idea here is that we are set apart for God's holy purpose in the same way that Jesus was set apart for God's holy purpose. For their sake, I consecrate myself that they also may be sanctified in the truth. Now, look at the next line. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. The idea here. The idea here is that Jesus was set aside to proclaim the gospel and lead people to faith in Christ. And we are sanctified in the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we are set aside for the same gospel proclaiming purpose as Jesus. I don't know if you're following this. It's 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 almost difficult for me to explain because I misread John John 17 so many years. I missed the point. Set them apart for your holy purpose through your truth. You as you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake I consecrate myself that they also may be consecrated, sanctified in the truth. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. They are set apart to help others become believers in Jesus Christ. My friends, there is this famous Holocaust survivor named Viktor Frankl, and he wrote a lot about suffering. He observed that his fellow inmates in concentration camps were more likely to survive the horrific conditions if they had a sense of meaning. I want you to get this. This man spent time in concentration camps. He saw the worst suffering in the world. And as he witnessed that suffering, he discovered a incredible key to life, which is that having a sense of purpose and meaning brings uh, help in trials. There is a tremendous benefit to a sense of purpose and meaning when you face trials. Now check this out. You are sanctified by Jesus, you are set apart for his holy purpose. Yes, he wants you to grow, grow in holiness, but that's not what John 17 is talking about. John 17, verse 17 says, set them apart for a holy purpose in the truth. Your word is truth. Okay, you're set apart. What does that mean? Does that mean you grow in holiness? Well, certainly that's true, but that's not what this text is talking about. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. 
you have the same gospel preaching ministry purpose that Jesus had. Jesus says, for their sakes, I consecrate myself. I consecrate myself, what? To that mission of Jesus, that they also may be, same same Greek word, hagio, may be sanctified in the truth, that they may be set aside in the truth. I don't ask for these only, but for those who will believe in me through their word. Church family, <laughs> Victor Frankl, he wrote something really cute. He called it Sunday neurosis, all right? So he says, after the work week is over, and now it's Sunday, and the new week has not quite begun for so many people. They get a two-day weekend. He, he had this thing he called Sunday neurosis that refers to the dejection that people feel at the end of the working week when they realize just how empty and meaningless their lives have become. And then this, this existential vacuum may open the door to all sorts of excesses and compensations such as neurotic, anxiety, avoidance, binge eating, drinking, overworking, overspending. In the short term, these excesses and compensations carpet over the ex existential vacuum, but in the longer term, they prevent action from being taken and meaning from being found. Basically what he says is once you've worked all week and now it's Sunday and you've got nothing to do, then this sense of purposeless and meaningless takes over people and then they plunge into addiction to cover it up. And what I'm here to tell you is that if you are a believer, you have the most important mission in the world, just like God sent Jesus to tell the good news of a God of love and to give people the hope of everlasting life. You share that same mission, that same mission of proclaiming the goodness and love and generosity of God and leading people to hope, the hope of everlasting life. My friends, Victor said it this way, in some ways suffering ceases to be suffering at the moment it finds a meaning. Such is the meaning of a sacrifice. Suffering ceases to be suffering at the moment it finds a meaning. And my friends, your life has meaning and purpose. Its meaning is first and foremost to enjoy in intimacy with God, to enjoy the gift of everlasting life, to enjoy intimacy with his community. And it is to let others know about the incredible generosity and goodness of God. My friends, the Messiah has come. He healed the sick. He raised the dead. He gave sight to the blind. And it looked like everything was going to be a utopia. But Jesus said, not yet. You're going to still have tribulations. You're going to still have trials. And I'm praying for you. Trust in God's generosity. Trust that he has given you everlasting life. Enjoy intimacy with him and the community. And serve God's purpose of proclaiming the good news just like Jesus did. That is the antidote to tribulations and trials. That will bring healing and peace when you suffer loss and sickness and death and disease and all the things that seem to be so common, that are so common in our world. Let me pray with you. Dear God, we thank you for your goodness and love. We thank you for your generosity. Father, as we reflect on the trials and the tribulations that we face. Remind us of your great love for us. Remind us of the grace that you give. Remind us that we have the hope of everlasting life. Remind us of our community and remind us of the calling that you have placed on our lives. We pray these things in Jesus' name.